and now I leave the word to Valerio that is going to present, present Asyncron and a Python notebook magic for asynchronous cell execution. Test. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming back. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you um, about one um, IPython notebook in particular extension I made to solve one problem I had. But um, the main purpose of this talk is to try to get from you all the feedback you may give me because it was just my first attempt to play a bit with asynchronous I.O. and um, uh, IPython API. Okay, so uh, very quick premises. I'm uh, quite sure that any of you here uh, already understand what this common does. Is there anybody who doesn't know it? Okay, so basically this is just the execution of the uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, server without, in this particular case, without this, the uh, support of any browser uh, automatically opened. Uh, in case you don't know what Jupyter is, Jupyter is the, I may say, the evolution of the uh, old IPython project. In particular, uh, Jupyter is a very interesting project from many perspectives. And um, the, the, the main purpose of this project is now to be, as you may um, see from this picture, to be uh, as uh, language um, to be a language agnostic core of execution mm, in order to support mm, different um, execution environment. The main application of the Jupyter project is of course the notebook and in very two words we may uh, summarize the notebook as an uh, interpreter, a shell running in your browser. Okay, But actually it's more than that. Because in a notebook you may have different cell types and you may not only have your code but also your uh, documentation. If you want just a very quick example of Jupyter running, in this particular case I'm on my machine I installed two different kernels here. So when I create a new notebook I may decide which kind of kernel I would like to use. And um, in this case, I have Python 3 and R. And we'll see in a couple of slides that they basically look the same. So it's just, uh, the difference is just in the code you put on it. Uh, Jupyter is a very well-known and very actively developed <coughs> project, sorry. In fact, just a couple of days ago, the version 4.2 has been released. Um, as mentioned, these two notebooks, these are, of course, empty ones. And in, in the first case, this is the R kernel running, and here the Python tree running. But actually, they look exactly the same. Um, the architecture of Jupyter Notebook is based on three pillars. The first one is the notebook document format. Um, the document format is an open document format, and it is based on JSON. This means that whenever you save a file with the IPNB extension, you may open it with an editor, you may fancy, and you look uh, in it. And of course, you may zip it, you may serialize it, you may share it without the need of any uh, other application. Moreover, the interactive computer uh, computing protocol is very nice and very interesting to look at. And finally, the kernel, and this part, uh, this part here is the one that has been evolved and has changed it during the transition from IPython to Jupyter to support multiple languages. And actually, uh, nowadays, more than 50 kernels are available online. Okay, So you may check this URL here to, to see if there is any that uh, suits your need. Another very important feature of um, Jupyter and one of the main reasons that uh, makes uh, these um, technologies so famous is the so-called reproducible research. For researcher, this is a very nice tool to build notebooks that embeds not only 
the code to replicate the experimentation, but also the documentation to be released along your experiments. And this is very nice. And this supports, for instance, uh, the, the so-called open science movement. Okay. Uh, let's go then to the motivations that uh, led me to play a bit with these kind of technologies and um, try to figure out how I try to do that. Uh, the requirement I had is that sometimes it may be required according to considering the, the previous slide. So the fact that you embed your code and your documentation in a Jupyter notebook, sometimes it may be required to apply for heavy computations. And this is quite um, quite the case in case you, you do uh, experiments and uh, computational intensive cold cells, for instance. Uh, moreover, sometimes it may be required that this computation is actually executed on a remote server instead of your local machine. This is because, basically, um, apart from the security issues that, of course, may happen, in fact, uh, one big disclaimer I have to, um, uh, to tell you is that Jupyter developers do not of course, suggest to use Jupyter server in production because of many, many, many security flows. The first and the most important one is that when you go to the home page, one of the things you may do is to open a terminal. Okay? That's pretty easy and very easy to use if you're, of course, running on your machine, avoiding to open another application. You run a, a terminal basically in your browser. That's brilliant. But of course, it has a lot, many, many, many security flows. So please do not use the server in production. Even if you may apply, I may say, some restriction on the access, you may put passwords, you may uh, configure certificates uh, to go with SSL protocol, for instance, but again, it's not supposed to be to, to, to run in production. But since in case you're running, as I did in uh, my local network, uh, I had a remote machine I wanted to use just for computation. I didn't want to apply heavy computation on my laptop because it's, it, it cannot do that. And uh, so I configured a uh, Jupyter server running on that machine and calling the notebooks and creating the notebooks in a browser from this local machine. So uh, in, in the general case, this scenario could work in the general case. but. Since Murphy laws apply, this could be one error you may get. Suddenly, the connection goes timeout. And even in case you're executing a heavy computation in your cell, I figured out that basically there's no way to recover the output, to recover the execution. And actually, there is a reason why, because that's actually not supposed to do that, at least at the moment. Okay. So mm, I try to, to define uh, a way, a strategy, to cope with this kind of problem. Um, my first step, indeed, was, is there any possible solution to it? And I tried to think something. Uh, my requirements uh, in mind were, allow the execution on a remote machine also, of course, a local and a remote machine. I would like to avoid the client machine to do the busy waiting during the execution. So I would try to, to uh, the, um, decouple the execution from the client to the remote machine. So allow the remote machine to do all the job. And try to keep as much interactivity as may have. Because the Jupyter notebook is supposed to run interactively. It's very uh, easy to use and supposed to do that. So try to keep the interactivity of the notebook as much as possible. And it started like this, goes like this. Maybe it's not a good idea. OK, I may go ahead, try this one. So no, maybe this one is better. I don't know, it's not working in any way. OK, no, try to this drafts and finally got this. And this is basically the uh, final architecture I depicted, I designed on my, on my paper notebook. And it works in some way. Anyway. So back to my uh, to the title of my talk, asynchron. Uh, another title for this talk, another subtitle could be 
what I learned during my adventures in the world of Jupyter, multiprocessing and asynchronous I.O. And I said previously, um, uh, that was my first time taking a look uh, more deeply at the uh, API of Jupyter Notebook. And asynchronous I.O. was actually my very, very first time. It was uh, just an excuse to, to take a look at it because of the... Uh, of the media hype and for the great support Python 3, uh, which I strongly recommend, even for data science, um, has, especially in the 3.5 uh, version, plus multiprocessing, which um, also has been improved in Python 3, especially in Python 3.4, since Python 3.4. But, but uh, with multiprocessing, I, I have... I, I'm quite experienced with it, but not with the other two language technologies here. So, try to. I would like to share what I learned during my adventure. And first of all, I noticed that the Jupyter ecosystem is actually composed by many, many projects. So, what was initially just one single project named IPython that embedded all, actually not all, most of these projects in a one single code base. Now the approach, since it has to be a language agnostic, basically, the uh, development has been completely reviewed and the organization of the architecture plus the uh, organization of the projects, different project modules, have been completely decomposed in order to create different some projects. And all these projects are actually supposed to cope with different requirements. For instance, sorry, for instance, there is there are two, three these three projects coping with dealing with the user interfaces. First, in the notebook, the console, or the Qt console. And uh, for, uh, just to 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 give you a hint, uh, you may in case you have installed in your machine the uh, Python kernel of the uh, Jupyter project, and you run Jupyter console, it's basically the same to run a Python from your terminal, okay? So Jupyter console is supposed to be a language agnostic interface, depending on the kernel you're running. Uh, of course, there are many, many kernels. The default one is a Python, plus IPy widgets, which was um, a sub-module of the old IPython project, and the IPy parallel, which is the new name of the IPython parallel library which is a very interesting library to, to, to take a look at, uh, especially for parallel computation and heavy computation as a sort of uh, replacement, in some sense, of multiprocessing, which is based on the architecture of Jupyter. Moreover, there are other projects such as Jupyter Client and Jupyter Core, and as you may see from these uh, screenshots, uh, this has been taken from the official documentation uh, every single project has its link to uh, documentation and its own repository on the GitHub. It's basically uh, honed by the same GitHub user, which is the Jupyter user, but every single project has its own repository. Finally, there are projects uh, for the deployment of uh, uh, Jupyter servers and notebooks. One very interesting is the uh, Jupyter Drive, which is some integration with Google Drive. And uh, there is also a project which was uh, called uh, some time ago, I don't know if already supported, it's called Collaboratory. It's a very first attempt to, to try to do a, a notebook integrated into Google Documents, which means that you may basically uh, work on notebooks uh, the same way you do with Google Docs. So mm, even um, uh, synchronously with multiple users. But it was experimentally, I actually don't know how this uh, project, um, how far this project went. And finally, uh, and most importantly for this talk, uh, the formatting a conversion project, which are MB convert and MB format. Okay, so considering these sort of fragmentation and this very long list of projects, um, especially focusing on the last two of the last two projects, and looking back at the my requirement, 
please uh, try to clarify a bit what actually an IPython notebook magic is from a development point of view, of course. Yes? Whenever you fancy. Thank you, by the way. I have a couple of observations before we get deeper into, uh -huh. uh, just about Jupyter in general. First, uh, my viewpoint on IPython notebooks, which I think is worthwhile, is the actual realization of Donald Knuth's uh, um, dream of literate programming. Mm -hmm. uh, Knuth uh, tried mixing docs and, and code and did is a masterpiece as usual in the tech uh, book. However, that mix doesn't really work on paper. It works much better in an interactive exploratory environment, and that's exactly what a Python is. You you're documenting your research, and as it happens, the the uh, code goes there. I would also like to mention another deployment opportunity, which is uh, uh, Google Cloud Data Lab. It's IPython notebooks as a service. Wow. Um, it, there is no extra charge. You pay just the resources uh, on Google Cloud Platform you're consuming. Uh, it is not, uh, since it's run as a service, you can't really dig into the internals and modify them. So it's uh, Python 2.7 only. Uh, and uh, Matplotlib and and uh, um, the graphics from Google Docs, and uh, and you get uh, access to BigQuery, Google Cloud Storage, and, and Google Compute Engine. On Google Compute Engine, virtual machines, you can run anything you want. I found that, uh, and they, they part of not letting you modify the internals is that you can actually serve production from it at a flip of a switch, wow. and safely. Um, that's uh, thank you. I completely uh, missed that. Please, please uh, web search for uh, cloud, cloud uh, data lab. Data lab. Okay. Yeah, it's it's intended very specifically for data exploration. It's okay. an open source project on GitHub. They welcome pull requests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a bit of a rant because I, I, I would like just to understand why, maybe you cannot tell me exactly why, but why Google support only Python 2? And it starts with Google App Engine with this kind of stuff. 2.7 at last, but why is only Python 2? It's quite strange. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, uh, a bit more in details, IPython magics. Uh, IPython magics are a technology uh, available since IPython version 3. And this system uh, is a sort of um, mini common language which is basically orthogonal to the syntax of IPython. It's very easy to use and I'm quite sure that sometime you use it maybe without knowing exactly uh, what's, what's, what's going on in the back, in the back end. Uh, magically, uh, magic, sorry, are meant to be uh, typed interactively. And one thing I would like to, to point out, it's how easy it is to extend the user, uh, uh, the, the, this language with new comments. Uh, basically, the magics are meant to be typed interactively, so they follow uh, they follow the common line conventions, uh, for instance, the white space for separating arguments, dashes for options, and stuff like that. And magix uh, comes in two um, come in two different flavors: line magix, prepended by one single percent character, and cell magix, two percent characters as uh, markers. And sometimes uh, these could be also combined. For instance, a very common and Mm, uh, widely uh, used magic is the time it. I've, I've used, please um, let me clarify this, I've used this syntax just to, it's a sort of regular expression stuff, just to, to tell you that this magic could be used just only with one single percent, which basically means line magic, or two uh, percent markers, which means cell magics. In fact, here you may use it, time it, and this magic applies only to this line. In this case, the time it applies to the entire 
content of the cell. Okay? Is the difference clear? Okay. Um, another example of magic is the LS magic, which basically lists all the magics available in your environment. And another quite famous magic you surely use is the matplotlib inline, which basically activates the inline backend of matplotlib to have your charts displayed in line within notebook cells instead of external windows, of course. And how difficult it is to write your own custom magics? It's pretty easy. You may do in the very simple, simplest way. In this case, I just defined uh, three functions here. Uh, L magic, uh, C magic, or LC magic. LC means line cell magic, of course. I had to import from the IPython core magic these three decorators, and I decorated basically the the three functions. Uh, you may see that inter the interface is quite simple to understand. In case of a line magic, you get the line as the argument. In case of a cell magic, you get the line and the cell. And in case of um, cell line magic, you may have the uh, optional parameter of cell depending on how you use it, of course. So if cell is none, it means that this has been called as a line magic. And all you need to do after that is just to copy your file, I here called for simplicity custom magic pi, in this particular folder. Uh, the, in, of course, I'm running on my, uh, my Mac machine, and this applies also to um, Unix-based machine in general, so Linux, for instance. Not for Windows, the path here is a bit different, but it's just a matter of file path. And you have to um, copy this file in the startup directory under the profile default. Um, just a bit of clarification. Um, in case you were familiar with profiles in IPython 3, in the IPython 4, which means Jupyter, uh, the profile has been changed. Actually, you may not create the profile anymore. So the profile default is just the uh, backward compatible name of the folder you may have to use. Uh, and that's it. In fact, if you use it in the notebooks, you may, after that, you run your notebook, that, that custom magic pi file is loaded at uh, runtime when you start your notebook, and that's it. So I did line magic, basically, and my uh, code is pretty simple. I just returned the line, plus, in this case, had some prints just to figure out how, what was the standard output for this print, for instance. And uh, I uh, noticed that actually the standard output is just the output of the notebook. Okay? So in this case, I called these with double marker here. So it's uh, basically a cell magic instead of a line magic. And C magic is here. Okay. So, and as you see, the line here are passed. So the, the content of the line is passed as string. Okay. If you want to try to improve a bit your code, there is an object-oriented way to do it, and it has some more advantages. I'll try to, to explain you in a second. Uh, you may, instead of defining simple, very simplistic functions, you may also create classes. So uh, if you import uh, these uh, decorators and superclass, in, in this case, magics, the, the, uh, your own magic must uh, subclass the magics class and must be decorated with the magics class here. And you have the same decorators applying to methods. In this case, you have the self parameters, of course. But the, 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 the most important difference is that uh, in, since you're getting the self here object, the magics embeds all the information uh, you uh, may have access uh, from the IPython notebook. In fact, uh, of course, the, the other difference is that you have to, to get the current IPython shell here and register these to the list of uh, available magics. I would like to point you out with this piece of code here. I am going to, in, when I'm going to use this class L magic, magic, sorry for the double, uh, for the uh, repetition, but maybe it's not so clear in the name, sorry. Um, I'm going to access the username space here. Uh, maybe it's not clear, uh, but I'm going to access the shell object 
available in self, so it's imported in the magix class, and the user underscore ns, which a user namespace defined during the execution of the shell. In fact, here I use it, and I'm gonna I have a full access to the main a Python object, which is basically here, and uh, I, the, these objects is of type ipykernel zmq shell blah blah blah, and this gives you an hint how the the backend is going and is working. And here, these are the variables defined in my user namespace. So you basically have access to all the namespace here. It could be useful for my purposes. Another very interesting thing I look at is the notebook data format. As mentioned previously, it is JSON-based. If you take a look at it, it's very simple e even to understand reading it. Basically, the, you have the cells here, array of objects, and every object here is a cell. You have cell type metadata, uh, the source in case you have, uh, of course, in case the cell type is code, these um, attribute embeds the, the actual code. In case uh, it, markdown here, you have the markdown code. And more complicated examples, these is a code cell here. You have the execution count for it. Uh, you may know if it is collapsed or not, and you have the outputs here in case the cell has the output in the notebook. And finally, you, these uh, objects hands with a metadata object here, embedding all the information required to pass the file. Since you may have multiple version of the multiple formats for this, in fact, here in the metadata you have, for instance, uh, the MB format major version here for. The minor version is zero, okay. And of course, the, the, the version of the kernel used and stuff like that. If you want to test the notebook APIs, so you, all you need to do is try to import the MB format, which is another project in the ecosystem I mentioned before. So current MB format is the format of the running IPython, um, sorry, Jupyter notebook. In this case, it's four. Uh, I import the, N, the read function called, in this case, with an alias mbf underscore read, which is basically the function to read uh, notebooks files. Uh, I import, I've imported, just to do clarification, all the different versions. Here you have four different versions. Ver, uh, versions. So here are the path of the different modules. And then I just played a bit with the API. They're very pretty, uh, simple to use. Uh, MBF read reads the file with a specific version, for instance. I filtered, in this case, all the cells by simply access nb.cells here. I s basically here filtered, uh, iterated over all the cells that whose uh, cell type is code, and then put these cells in the list. So this is uh, an excerpt of the output I got it. And then I created a new cell for the output and appended that output to the last cell. So basically, this is what the variable last cell looked like. And finally, I may, for instance, use the, uh, the write function to get all the, the, all the cells, write down in a new notebook or in the same notebook, and maybe, and, and that's it. It's very simple. So when I uh, took a look at these APIs, very easy to use, very simple. Uh, my feeling was, OK, absolutely fantastic. That's what I need. OK. So back to our issue to solve. So the, the math is low here. Uh, why is that? Uh, this happens because in the back end, the, the communication that's going on um, is based on message passes. Okay, the architecture is very complicated, and one rant I have to say is that, unfortunately, during the uh, transition from IPython to Jupyter, the documentation is not so up. Um, it's not a problem of up to date, but uh, complete. Okay, so it's a kind of a mess to figure out how you may find the up to date information because some documentation is. Uh, not really up to date because it refers to the IPython 3 version has been copied, not yet updated, blah blah. Okay, so uh, in very in the very general terms, uh, 
uh, I would like to, to, to say that the communication from client to server happens um, at soccer levels with the message passing interface and they, the guy, the developer, did an astonishing job to uh, try to standardize the, the, the message passing protocol. So the, 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 my very first idea was, at the very early stage, was run the heavy computation using the right API, try to uh, add the, the, the new cell, the output cell to the notebook, and that's it. But the drawbacks, of course, are you have no interacting, uh, no interactivity here, no way to auto-refresh the content, and unfortunately, sorry, um, I can actually, oh yeah, um, no interactivity, no way to auto-refresh uh, the content, so it's not exactly what I was uh, thinking about. And so my next step has been try to see if there's anything already existing. Okay, try to not reinvent the wheel. Maybe, could be, sometimes, or so, sorry, somebody may uh, possibly had my same issue, my same concern about executing heavy computation in notebooks. Okay, so I try to look at many possible solutions, and I uh, came across very interesting ones, but not exactly what I was thinking about. First of all, the, 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 the very first thing to, I tried was the run magic. The run magic is a, a built-in magic already available in your IPython code. And it works very easy and uh, very uh, intuitively. Um, you apply run, and then you pass a file, and you have a lot of options you may use. For instance, you may pass the, the name of the module to execute instead of the main. And more importantly, you may also have the support for printing the time of execution. It's very easy to use. And so uh, what I did is, OK, implement a very simple file. And my, mm, my uh, first concern was trying to understand how the namespace works. Okay? So if I execute, if I run uh, an external file in a notebook, if this file defines variables, okay, there are these variables embedded in the namespace of the cell, so I may use it after the execution, for instance. I was thinking about, for instance, of a big, big machine learning model to execute, and then I would like to, to get the, 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 the training values, for instance, or the, I would like to, to use that object to fit the model, for instance. Okay? So I would like to, to, to check if the namespace has been uh, updated after the execution. So I defined this very simple, uh, uh, simple class then, I defined a very simple main function to execute, and then uh, uh, here I call it the function, and then defined here uh, an object in the local scope of the main uh, function, and then uh, uh, in the, the general scope of the of the entire uh, module, just to to understand if these two objects, so the dummy global here, just to uh, understand uh, if these objects are um, injected in the resulting namespace. And actually it is. So I run script to run. I got all the printing got during the execution. And then I checked the namespace. And I can easily access, easily access the namespace by, uh, for instance, printing the, the name of the, this object, which has been created during the execution of this file. Okay, So the namespace is perfectly managed by the run uh, extension. So then, a bit more complicated example. I defined a main heavy, because I'm, I'm looking for heavy computation, right? So I mm, complicated a bit the main here, just to pass some arguments, pass these arguments, and understand if I want to run this file with a simple execution of a heavy execution here. The heavy here is it's not really heavy, but uh, it's just to, 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 to do a BC computation. And then I test it. So I run this. OK. Everything works perfectly fine. Here I pass this option to get even the, the time, I, uh, the execution time. So very interesting. And uh, I, I have the namespace here. But if you take a look at this, I try to execute both, both the, shell, the shells. Uh, during running uh, after this one, I, I try to run this one, and these two cells are running uh, one after the other. So basically, the interactivity requirement I had in my mind is not respected. 
okay? Because this works in batch mode in, in, some, in some terms, okay? So I decided to not use it uh, for my purposes. Then I came across this very interesting project, uh, Run, uh, Run IPy, and actually I just uh, posted this screenshot because this project is just uh, three, th three very simple files, and actually they are two files, main and notebookrunner.py, okay? And this project, uh, I wanted to mention it because it helped me a lot to cope with the difficulties I figured out when I wanted to learn more uh, of the API from the, document, the official documentation of Jupyter. Because I, I took a look at the, the internals of these two scripts and understand a bit how these work. Um, okay, so these are the, the, the four files. And here, a closer look. This is the main.py file. So basically, one uh, very interesting thing this script does is support multiple version of the IPython working. So you may use it in case you have IPython 3, IPython 4, which is Jupyter, or um, IPython 2 also. So uh, these wraps the different API conventions uh, according to the different version you have. And moreover, in the, the main function is just a sort of passing arguments. You have a lot of options. For instance, you may uh, pass the quiet uh, option to not have the output during the execution. And basically, the, the main purpose of this um, uh, script is just to take the read, you may see, uh, read the, uh, from these few lines of code, you may read by satiating a notebook runner class here. You read a notebook in input, you execute it cell by cell, and then you may uh, print it out again using the API. Okay? And this is a sort of um, uh, more uh, engineered version of what I had in mind previously, because it uh, cope with the message passing protocol and the uses the uh, Jupyter API working on the notebook. In fact, I discovered this method, run cell. Run cell is in the notebook runner, and basically these do, uh, these does all the stuff here. So execute the cell input here. For each cell, it iterates over, and then uses the message passing protocol here. So connect to the socket, uh, uh, wait for the response, uh, or log, uh, logs error in case of miscommunication problems, and then uh, update the, the, the output and using the IOPub message protocol, and that's it. So it's very easy to, to read. It's just a Python file. So I think about it, and then I concluded that it has many advantages. The notebook APIs, it's a, it's a plus because it's use it, it uses it. Uh, it uses the camera protocol messaging, and it has support for multiple document formats the unformat version I mentioned before, but again, no interactivity, no support for online execution or non-blocking execution, because it basically runs offline. And there is a characteristic which is, it's not a bad, uh, but not a, uh, no, no pros or cons, it's just in the middle, uh, because it, it does no support for multiprocessing. I mean, since it runs offline, uh, you're not able to run uh, multiple cell at a time, so you have to wait that each cell is, is executed one after the other. So the idea was try to borrow some code from RunIPy and re-implement it as an IPython magic with steroids because I wanted to add some a uh, bit more functionalities. And again, my feeling was okay. Now absolutely fantastic again. But after that, if you try to replicate these pieces of code, the these few lines of code here in a uh, in, in inside a notebook, these hangs on in, in the protocol communication, and more um, and worsely, it has no link with the current shell because it basically creates a new kernel manager, so a new shell for the kernel. So there's no way to get, at least as I discovered, uh, there's no way to get the output from the execution and put that output in the current notebook. Okay. So my feeling became mm, not good. So finally, uh, what I uh, finally 
uh, thought and try to implement. So I decided to get all the best I learned from these two or three examples I came across. And then I thought that IPython is heavily based on Tornado. Okay? So IPython basically run, uh, runs on Tornado and the event loop of the IPython and that one which manages all the communication with the different clusters and different clients is based on Tornado. And uh, the, 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 me, the thing I did was to take a look at this book. It's a bit outdated, but it has, it's a very tiny one, so I strongly suggest it. Uh, but it has some very uh, clarifying examples. Since it was my very first time dealing with asynchronous I.O., um, this book in includes uh, some uh, clarifying examples about the very difference between the blocking mode against the asynchronous mode. Okay? So, what I did, I tried to explain it uh, by a series of screenshots, but I would like to just to, to give you the hint of the general idea I, um, I decided to, to, to test. The idea was, try to use, uh, since uh, the, the premise is, is since um, IPython notebook is heavily based on JavaScript, okay, it has a lot of JavaScript and it has two advantages on using JavaScript. It has a, a sort of Python wrapper of the JavaScript running during the not in the notebook, and plus it has its own JavaScript library with an IPython object defined in the namespace in the JavaScript uh, namespace. I mean, so. Um, the notebook is heavily based on JavaScript. So my idea was, from the client point of view, so in the client side, try to use a WebSocket. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in the uh, magic extension, I developed a web server, uh, an asynchronous web server, Tornado-based, uh, which uh, accept connections from Python and JavaScript. Uh, the JavaScript part is just to update the execution of the shell, uh, of the, the cell, sorry. Um, inject some HTML code just to have a placeholder to update when the WebSocket becomes ready. And then uh, leave all the computation to the Python backend. And the Python backend should be based on uh, concurrent requests. So basically, every request he gets should uh, delegate some process to execute it in, in the background, and when the results will be ready, notify that to the WebSocket listening on that port and update the output. Okay, so that's the general idea I had. So in terms of code, what I did was, I have very few minutes, so I'll try to, to uh, explain it uh, very briefly. This is the code of the magic. I basically defined two magic here. The, the, the one is just a, a sort of utility. I used two lines magic just to start and stop the server directly from the notebook instead of running the, uh, the, 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 script, the server script from the common line it's just for that. So it's not real logic here. The, the async run server is the, the, the Python class I defined to to deal with the uh, to deal with this uh, communication, uh, and uh, every time I run a server here, I decided to um, to assign a single thread for uh, these uh, servers. So basically, the execution of the server is uh, running in, on a different thread of the um, of the notebook that invoked this. Um, that should not be a big problem because. Uh, even if we know that uh, threads in Python are sometimes not a very good idea, and actually uh, I was willing to, to to attend a talk we should have here at Python, but maybe we may uh, have time to to discuss about it during the questions. Um, but it should be just I/O communication, so may not be a big concern using threads. Um, then this is the asynchron line cell magic here. Uh, basically what it does is to instantiate here the WS connector, which is an object which uh, embeds all the necessary information. Here, the shell, we are running the notebook. 
here. And uh, the, the actual code to run, which is basically the string of the code to execute in this shell. And then we connect to the, to the socket. And before leaving this piece of code, this is just the, the, the very few lines of the extension here. Um, before leaving the, the, the execution here, we inject here some uh, specifically um, uh, manipulated HTML plus JavaScript code that I will show in the next slide. Uh, just to create and the WebSocket from the client side that put it uh, listening on the port I used for communication. And then I return the output as an HTML output here. And here, in, in, even if I didn't mention this function, it's just an import of uh, an object from the IPython uh, API. This is the very simple uh, JavaScript. Uh, at least I have to implement some JavaScript. Uh, and uh, what it does is basically to uh, check for some uh, cookie, because what I wanted to, to, to do here is that uh, in case you're running, uh, basically the, when you, the document ready function here calls this check cookie function, which is not displayed, I'm sorry, but uh, no, it's not in the next slide. Uh, but the, 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 the point here is, in case you created, uh, I uh, defined a session ID here. So every time I create a connection, I create a new session ID. And I, for each session ID, I create a cookie. Uh, and that's because I would like to, um, to keep the status of the connection between, thank you, between the connection and uh, the client and the server side. Uh, because in case you would refresh the notebook, you should not lose the connection, the reference to the connection, or even the result you got during the execution, in case the WebSocket closes, closed before. Uh, in case you have no cookie for that session, basically you have to call this function, the request cell output here, which creates the WebSocket, and when it opens the connection, get uh, passes the connection ID to the, to the server, just to, um, to, to pair the, the, the session ID from the client side to the execution on the server side. And when the, the data will be ready on the WebSocket, it should pass the, the data, uh, the data in, uh, in the JSON here, and then put uh, the, uh, update the HTML here using the Python JavaScript functions here. And this is just to update. Uh, this is a sort of hack I discovered. In case the execution generates an error, so it has a, has a bit more complicated output so in, in HTML. With this function, it's, it's able to get the HTML output uh, inside the notebook. So in this case, you, in case a uh, some error happens to the execution, you see it in the notebook as you have executed it normally. Okay? And uh, so if you have some output here, you put it and you set the cookie and that's it. So it's... Uh, I hope you, I give you the, the basic idea how this works. Uh, this is the server. Sorry, this is... Uh, this. I mean, here it's not more client-side. I mean, the client-side execution, but this code is in server-side. In fact, it's Python code. And uh, this is the code referred to the uh, connection from JavaScript here, uh, because I connected passing some parameter, which is JSON role, a cost and undefined. And basically, when uh, you connect to the WebSocket from the client side, what you need to do is just to get the job queues. I defined a list of queues, one per session ID here. And then uh, I, uh, mm, I, exp I, I wait for the results to be ready on this queue. Okay, So basically, the queue is a, a data structure I use to communicate uh, the, ex the, the availability of the result after the execution. So basically, this piece of code um, hangs on the queue until the task is complete here. And this is the connection from, for the Python side, so the actual execution of the, uh, of the, of the code to run. So this is the, the connection uh, function called when I instantiated the WS connect object. So I connect here to the socket. In this case, it's connection from Python. So uh, uh, on connected, I basically get all the data I need to, to uh, 
uh, to pass. This is basically, um, in very few words, uh, um, the passing and the um, no, uh, serialization, sorry, the serialization of the namespace because one of my requirements was when I need to execute the content of a cell, I may have access to the namespace because some of some dependencies of the variables inside the call cell. I mean, if I want, I have defined in a cell a list of 100 numbers, and I want in the, that to, to sum over none numbers without defining that variable, the execution of that cell would not work in any way because I have no access to the, 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 the variable defined in the previous cell. I hope to, 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 to have been clear about it. In, in case, please ask question. And uh, these, uh, so basically here, I try to uh, serialize the data using or the JSON module or the Pickle module. And this is one thing I would like to discuss at the end of this talk. And finally, um, is, so this is the code. Uh, this is the code executed from the Python side. So basically, if Python is the role, I instantiate a new thread executing the self-run here. And the run method basically instantiates uh, an, a pool of processors uh, with that uh, submit the, the execute cell. The execute cell is the code that actually performed the, the execution of the code here, passing the code to run and the use namespace. And uh, the process were completed is the function to be executed when the future here is available um, thanks to concurrent executor here. And, and that's it. This is the final code. Uh, I, uh, this is when the, this is the code uh, it is executed um, when the results are available. So basically the uh, Mm, the data have been are posted to the queue, and that's, uh, along with the the, uh, the, the, uh, the the namespace here, and uh, results are written uh, in the on the connection here on the socket. So they are passed to the client side, which is was waiting for it, and then uh, the execution works. Uh, very few notes about, of course, limitations. It's very it's full of limitations, of course. It's just an experimental game I did. And, but I would like to point out that so far, my code is based on Pickle and JSON serialization, which is one of, in my humble opinion, one of the major flow of Python multiprocessing module. Because in case you would like to execute the uh, multiprocessing uh, with Python objects which are not Pickable serializable, you are not able to do that in any way. Uh, in fact, you have when you use multiprocessing, you have to define in the global scope the pool of uh, the pool of process, and then you, the, the 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 function to apply multiprocessing should be a function, not a method, because the methods are not pickable and stuff like that. Um, one attempt I would like to use uh, is the deal module, which is um, a sort of reimplementation of the pickle. Module and this work because uh, this works because uh, or should work because it's based on a reimplementation of the multiprocessing module that tries to cope with those issues I mentioned before and of course I need to improve the infrastructure to handle errors because they are not really handled yet and uh, apart from the IPython JavaScript inter integration and finally not going to be any demo because of the aforementioned Morpheus load, but I was joking, of course. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but... Two times you have. Two times? According to me, at least. No, we have like one minute. <laughs> okay. Very quick question. Synchronous question can be asked uh, <laughs> during the, the <laughs> lunch break. Okay. A quick question. Okay, thank you, Valeria. Thank you very much.